and welcome back to the second and final episode of the Jimmy House Podcast. Today, we have Amir Deuced. Introduce yourself, Amir. Hey guys, my name is Amir Deuced. Uh, I'm a... I, I, do you want to pull out the script that you wrote? <laughs> I've never done this before. <laughs> Um, I've known Jimmy for <laughs> since high school, which was probably like close to 10 or 11 years. Um, he's been my coach for around that time, give or take. Um, and I am currently a graduated uh, law school grad. Can I do that over again? <laughs> Hell no, brother. No, oh. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm going to cut that. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay. I've, I've, Passed the bar, I've graduated law school, and uh, I'm currently awaiting my um, licensure to Arizona. Beautiful. So, with Amir, in today's world of social media, you have a lot of influencers, per se, trying to depict their story to elicit inspiration or whatever the case may be. And a lot of these people are extremely inspirational. However, Amir is one of the top people that come to mind to me in my livelihood, in my experience, that is just as, if not more inspira inspirational than many of the people you see online, but because he's a lawyer and doesn't use Instagram all that much, you don't get to know his story. And I wanna be able to take the bits of Amir that have inspired me as somebody that has known him basically since he was in high school and talk about how he's become a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu purple belt, a lawyer, a friend, a dad. I'm not a dad. <laughs> I'm not a dad. <laughs> but somebody that has gone through some of the hardest things I've ever seen anyone gone through and come out to say he's elite level in Jiu-Jitsu, a lawyer nonetheless, got through ASU Law School and had to go through something as serious as his own mother's passing to come out to be the person that he is today. So I wanted to touch on a lot of that. And we talk about the story that comes up when we think about our past and everything like that. Well, it kind of started in high school. And I remember the first, the first memory that we won't talk about is, is one. But the second thing that comes to mind is when you're going for the school squat record to get on the, the leaderboard for that. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, at our high school, we had a record board for various lifts. I believe it was squat, power clean, um, bench, and I, I think that was it. But um, the uh, gentleman's my right. He broke. The, he broke the uh, the record for the squat. You're not a gentleman. Uh, a You're a woman. <laughs> he broke the record for uh, for the squat just a couple years before I graduated. Um, I, I remember too, because he was a couple years older than I was. It was like one of the most like legendary, like things to go around the school. Um, it was one of my peak high school <laughs> performances. And when I say peak high school performances, I mean peaked in high school. But thanks, Amir. Thanks for the reminder. Go ahead. Um, and Matt never got a record, by the way. So Matt just never peaked at all. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <for that>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and so, um, so it, it, uh, it inspired me a little bit when I was a, a senior in high school. Um, I played football um, all four years of, of high school. Um, I was pretty naturally strong uh, like as I got into puberty, so I, I figured why not give this a shot. Um, originally, I wanted to go for a power clean kind of thing, and um, that I just, I just couldn't get it down, that technique that is just so um, nuanced and it just requires so much that I, I just didn't have at the time as far as skill and ability. Um, but I did, <laughs> it's true. Um, I did want to try and do the squat and I did notice that like I had um, an inclination towards the squat and just that strength and an area of things. So I decided why not? Um, I didn't give it much preparation, um, which obviously in hindsight was, um, not smart on my part, but I decided to do it. I wanted to leave kind of a, a lasting memory for myself um, and just have my name on that board, I yeah. think was kind of like my biggest thing that my senior year, like that was my project. Um, and I went for it the first time. I think, I believe I went for like 455. And uh, in high school they do, what's that? Irving, Irving was spawning you, correct? Yeah, spawning. so. Irving, um, Irving Dominguez, if you guys heard of him. Our, our, our good friend Irving, um, he, uh, 
he came to spot me. He specifically, he had graduated <laughs> two years before and uh, he specifically came to the school to spot me. And I just, I just remember like, it was a very, it was a very neat experience at first. Irving was behind me, we were getting hyped up. Um, I think it was like, I was supposed to go for like 4.55 for like, or something or five something like that because they do the projected maxes in high school um, Irving was behind me I was going uh, one I went two I went three and then like I was getting really hyped up and I like got stapled by the and uh, good old Irving didn't save me from the staple um, did not. no I, I, I folded uh, pretty bad and uh, and it wasn't till like I was like the bar was on the rack and I was like <laughs> pinned essentially <laughs> Until Irving like snapped out of it. <laughs> you, know, like, you know there's a video of somebody dying that way. And, oh like, really? Yeah, like somebody legitimately died that way. Like the way that oh, you that's went down right. yeah. specifically. Yeah. You know, this is not really a joke, it's just serious. But also like, you know, just so you know. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> um yeah, yeah, in that same exact way. But obviously you had the safety pens, which is why you need to use safety pens when you're squatting. Don't forget. Go yeah. ahead. Um so all that said, um, I, it was like a good week. I wasn't sure if I even wanted to go for it again. Um, and I think I texted you just, I, you had asked me to keep you updated on how it went. And then you mm -hmm. texted me back. I remember your first thing, your first text back was, why did Irving let you die? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you were, I like, we had talked, like we were friends, but I wouldn't consider us like super close. I think yeah. we were close enough to like have like a conversation like that. And, um, you were like, let like I think I can get you to that point and this is this was the point where you were kind of in the throes of your like powerlifting yeah. career um, and you were like I think we can get it let's get it like meet me you just you basically just gave me an address in a time you're like meet me at Die Hard Gym in yep, yep. Glendale Arizona um, and like at 9 a.m. I'll, I'll like we're, we're gonna get through it I'm like okay so I met you there I'd never been in this gym before either like um, mm -hmm. I think it was like maybe again like one of the third or fourth like prolonged conversations we had had in person so um that was also like one of my first experiences with you and like also just kind of what started our friendship was yeah. um i just remember thinking like this guy like is obligated to me in no way shape or form like he is like he has no he almost has no like relationship with me he has no duty to me but like he like wants to help me really bad which is amazing like this is like this is the kind of person that I like, I want to be friends with. And so, um, so I, I met you there and I think we spent like a good hour or two. Mm -hmm. And like, unfortunately, like a lot of high school coaches, um, and I'm not trying to like bag on anybody in particular, but like a lot of high school coaches generally, um, I feel like don't teach a lot of proper technique and don't teach yeah, a lot it's of terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. And I, I like, I blame a lot of my mobility issues that like recently were remedied through your coaching, um, on that. And like a lot of the injuries that then caused the further like tightness and immobilities that I had on that just like, and I don't even blame them specifically. They learned from some guy like, back when they were in high school who learned from some guy when they were in high school and so on and so forth. Like it's a terrible cycle and you kind of learn this like really antiquated, um, technique that, that just doesn't serve anyone very well. And that's when you end up with the, the knee injuries, the shoulder injuries. Like I know guys from high school still using that technique who have just mm -hmm. been like, who've torn up shoulders, who've torn up like, and then now they can't lift and they're only like 25, 26 years old. Yeah. Um, which is really unfortunate. But that said, like within like an hour and a half, I think we had to like try and break some of those like habits that I developed over like the four years that I was in high school. Um, and it was like a very specific, like low bar wide squat technique that mm -hmm. just fit my own immobilities at the right. time. Cause yeah. I had like zero hip mobility, zero ankle mobility. Like you're just like, okay, this is what we have to work with. And I think we can, I think we can do it. So you were like, let's go for like 10 to 20 pounds heavier than you went before. So I <laughs> never had this weight on my back, like anywhere close to it. And you were like, let's go like one more rep than you did before or something like that. 
and um, you kind of gave me like a quick like peak week powerlifting kind of thing yeah. or like lift this day this day and this day do not touch a weight this day like meet me at the high school mm -hmm. And, and like keeping in mind, this is all, this is just something that I wanted to do before I graduated. So I was technically like not even, uh, I think like our senior last day was uh, two weeks before that or something like that. Yeah. And so like, so you cheated. I mean, technicality, like technically it was before I graduated. So bro cheated. <laughs> But, um, so we got there and I, I remember even like the coach at the time was like, he didn't get it last time. You think he's going to get it this time? <laughs> and like with so much faith, like so much like confidence, you looked him in the eye and you're like, yeah, he's going to get it. I body slammed it. And, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right into it's the like, mirror. Bro, why'd you do that? That's I why I said, look, I'm trying to make a point to all these 16 year olds that yeah. I'm the man here. You listen to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm the king now. Yeah, um, and um, somehow I didn't get in trouble. <laughs> it's crazy. Go ahead. Um, so um, we we got under the uh, the bar, and I like it. I remember the video looked effortless. Like it was. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a stark contrast from the first time I did it because I remember the conversation we had too was like, don't get so like hyped up in this yeah. like, um, in the like excitement of things. Don't do this whole like screaming, shouting thing. Mm -hmm. Cause that was also the thing in high school football was like, we were essentially taught like if you weren't screaming or shouting, like you weren't working hard enough, yeah. which is really silly thinking about it now as a, as a 26 year old, mm -hmm. like uh, it's just like, obviously it doesn't help you any, like distracts you. It, it, um, keeps your mind off of like what you're supposed to be focusing on, which is at the time lifting the weight. Um, but we, we got it, we lifted it and, uh, I was able to get on the board and, and that was that. But then obviously like that, that turned into like our friendship now. Yeah. And I think it like renewed my, um, my love for like lifting at the time. Cause then it was just kind of like a means to, and I'm like, I think more often than not, like kids got uh, male specifically in high school, um, whether it's for like a sport, whether it's just for confidence, whether it's for like girls, whatever it is, like I think at one point or another, most um, males in high school will end up picking up a weight yeah, and totally. like trying to lift, but like they don't really keep these like, um, these other things in mind, like technique, um, like mobility, like recovery, so on and so forth. And I remember that was just all, I mean like still, like now that it's almost been a decade later, like I'm still learning so much. Yeah. And had I not, like, had we not, like, had that interaction, I don't think I'd be anywhere close. I, I honestly, yeah. I think I'd be, en I'd end up being one of my peers who went up hurt by the age of 25 and yeah. then just, like, can't even bench anymore. Right. Um, so all that to say, like, on that end of things, I'm extremely, like, grateful that we did have that interaction because mm -hmm. had I not, like, yeah. Right. And so I think that brings up a great point because if you think about it, even back then, that was still when I was relatively new in my understanding of, of lifting and everything else. Obviously, much less evolved to where I'm at now and same for yourself. And basically what I saw was just, yeah, like, just a few simple critiques such as fixing your stance or, like, switching to a low bar. And it's, like, playing within the standard, which at the time there was no standard. So we'll just do whatever it takes to get on the board, right? But when I think about it now, if I'm, if I'm a high school athlete and I'm in the weight room, especially if there's any type of leaderboard that I'm trying to get on, if I'm the coach that's in charge of all that, the biggest thing that I have to do is hold a high standard per lift and judge it as closely as you would in a legitimate weightlifting or powerlifting competition because there's no reason why high schoolers should be handling heavy loads and bouncing it off their chest or squatting halfway down or wrapping their knees up till God's end because it's within the rules and if, if the high schooler just doesn't know how to squat and they're wrapping their knees before they figured out how to squat all the way down, then there's just something wrong with the general strength training program. But to your point, 10 years ago, that's a, how long it's been. Yeah. <laughs> 10 years ago, that was the standard. And there's a lot of high school videos you see out there, even college, where you see a big hype fest and it looks really, really cool. But underneath the bar, there's some serious weight, but not all the time great form. And it's very easy to tell in a lot of these videos, especially coming from high schools, that the person is just handling too much weight for what they can truly do for a true standardized technique, such as a pause on a bench press or squatting all the way down. These things that are inevitably gonna keep the high schooler safe, but also 
be a true standard of what strength actually is. Because I remember at that time, where the high school they were at, it's like, I remember doing 345 at like 195 pounds, but I had paused it uh, and, and, and got it up. But that was just off of the top six or whatever they had. But number six through one had all done douche that. And it's just like, it's just not even the same. So it's yeah. just, why don't we just erase all the records period and have a standard from the beginning that goes, you have to pause, somebody has to say press and then boom. Well, this isn't powerlifting. I don't think it even matters because if there's a standard of technique that's set, at least you know the records are legitimate records as opposed to, well, this person had less technique than the other. This person bridged their hips off the bench versus this person paused it, but this person isn't on the leaderboard because of that. I think that's kind of like a major flaw in the majority of strength programs that I've seen in high schools. And if there are programs that have this, then I say kudos to you, but it's just not very common. With the squat, for example, somebody that's actually making sure that you hit past 90 degrees, stuff like that, it's, it's, it's important because it, it keeps things like actually true to standard. If somebody half squats, and I remember a lot of the, the squats that I saw, you know, in my senior year and, and yours, I mean, like if we even look at it, mine and even yours at the time are like just above 90. Like they wouldn't even count in a powerlifting competition reali yeah. realistically. They counted in Mountain Ridge competition. Oops, I said it. They <laughs> counted in Mountain Ridge competition, but the reality is if we had squatted all the way down, our numbers would be way less. But that's lesser of our faults as 18 year old kids versus like the standard that needs to be set by the person that's running the program. That's huge. And especially as there's more and more inf information out now about strength training, that is something that to me is, is a non-negotiable. Like there's no reason that these things should not be in place from the beginning. So that's great. So the question to that is now knowing what you know now and now with your lifting evolved to what it is now, how does it feel Let's say in comparison to back then when you're benching X amount of weight, you're squatting 450 pounds for, a, or for four or five reps the way that you were versus now where maybe your working weight is, is much more in the 300s, but you're doing it raw, you're doing it all the way down, you're doing with the tempo, you're doing with the pause. If you're bench pressing, you have a, a controlled eccentric, you're pausing on the chest, all these things. How would you compare the, the strength from high school to now and even though that you may have been moving heavier numbers on the squat or what have you back then, you obviously can tell that you've gotten stronger, but that's where I try to tell a lot of people is that strength is not just this one universal thing and strength is not the literal number on a barbell. If Amira 18 is, is moving 455 four times through a finite range of motion versus Amir now who's repping out like, th I'm just throwing out numbers, 365 for reps at full range of motion with a tempo with a pause. That Amir that I'm talking to right now is, is worlds stronger than the one back in high school. And you would expect that, right? Through evolution and age and everything else. But, but it goes to show that the literal number on the bar is meaningless if there's not an element of control and maximizing range of motion and these things that we now know are so much more important than the literal weight that you're moving. So how, how would you describe your strength then versus now? Yeah, so um, I would say like if I was to put it into like two words, I guess the the high school lifting version of myself, I would call that like chaos because mm -hmm. it's everywhere. Like it's just this like chaotic, raw, like uncontrolled strength that has like no technique behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think you said it best um, in that like there are standards and that not only like high school should be holding kids to um, or any gym or any trainer, right? I think it's also like that you should be holding yourself to is this element of control mm -hmm. and this element of um, just, I, I think control is probably the best word is like just this controlled, um, concise effort to lift this weight or to yeah. increase your strength. And I guess in contrast now, I would say that like, my strength is probably much more refined. Mm -hmm. Um, but in that more effective, um, because through like having more technique through having more control, um, I've been able to increase my strength by, I, I couldn't even tell you how yeah. much, but like if myself at that age was holding myself to the standard that I'm holding to and that you hold me to as my coach. Now I don't think I'd be able to, lift it according to those standards and that refinement. Right. Um, and like I said, I, again, it's raw strength. That's fine. But like 
it only goes so far versus now I, I consider myself much more strong, much more mobile, much more refined because of those, those standards and that refinement. I mean, I think like not only like just recently, but like, I think since then to now, that's kind of been like the evolution of like, not only like my lifting of your lifting of all of your clients liftings, uh, or lifting journeys, um, I think is just that finding that refinement yeah. and finding that ability to, uh, produce strength <laughs> in a controlled manner. And I think, um, that's super important. And you touched on it too, like, um, being able to squat raw, at, like for, considerable amounts of weight. Like, um, I don't think I've worn my knee sleeves in probably three years, three right. or four uh, yeah. years. Yeah. Um, and I remember too, that was like, that was a requirement for me. Like yeah. and that, that wasn't even just like to get weight like up. That was simply because my knees just felt like they couldn't take the load. Mm -hmm. Um, if I was anywhere above 135. Right. Um, and again, it's just that, that came from that explosive chaotic strength that I think just like ruined me and did more detriment than anything else. Um, in comparison to, to now where I'm able to, um, like lift considerable amounts of weight without, without like sleeves, without anything. Like, um, I think I, yeah, again, I, I don't think I've used it, my sleeves in a while. I don't think I'll, I'll use my belt, mm -hmm. you know, at, at certain weights. But again, that was another thing where I just didn't have the stability in my, in my core and, mm -hmm. and everything else to be able to lift without a belt yeah. essentially. Um, so I think that's where that's, that's taken me. That's how I feel now. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. A lot of that stuff. Again, I, I reference the knee wrapping for high school kids. It's just like, why? You, even if it is to get on a record board, but it's just like, why? Like who, who allowed this to happen? Like if a high schooler needs to wear knee wraps to set a school record, that doesn't count for technically competition or anything like that. I mean, even in competitions, just the concept of knee wraps alone now, and, and even like in any other training, like I just, I'll be a hater, like in bodybuilding, just like, why? Like, why are we, why are we doing that? Why don't we actually just like do the things that are gonna allow the longevity in our joints to do these things over time? And when are we gonna realize that we don't have to put a ton of volume and do overloading of a particular muscle in order to grow it like when are we going to realize that like we are much more capable than what we give ourselves credit for so things such as knee wraps or knee sleeves which if you're doing a powerlifting competition and you're trying to maximize the weight you're doing knee sleeves probably makes sense yeah but coming from myself and you where when i was younger so when i was 18 19 20 21 same thing. I could not squat heavy without my knee wraps. I could not squat heavy without knee sleeves because it was just this mental block where I just literally tricked myself into thinking I, I could not do that. Mm -hmm. And now being 28, almost 30, I would I would rather squat without knee sleeves for the rest of my life than to do the, the latter because I know that I've built up the durability in my knees despite this knee injury. But yes, knee sleeves, bad, just kidding. I think these sleeves are good, but the majority of people that think that they do need them definitely don't. And if they spend a couple weeks, a couple months or longer to actually build up their resiliency and their durability and their knees without that, you'll probably find that the knee sleeves all along were, were a mental block more than anything. So, and that's where, you know, now with you doing jujitsu, let's talk about that a little bit. To this day, even though I don't do jujitsu ju as much as I used to, you're still one of the strongest people that I've ever rolled with. I mean, you're nowhere near Big Dan's level, but yeah. you're like pretty strong. Thank you. <laughs> no, but for real, like he's he's very very strong, and you can feel that. Versus, again, if we go back to when you're 18 or whatever, it's, you, you might have been moving literally more weight, but I guarantee you didn't feel nearly as strong as yeah. what you do now. And it could be man strength, it could be dad strength, you know, it could be all these different things. But at the end of the day you have been able to transfer that strength into something much more functional like jujitsu and actually have results from, from that too. And also be able to sustain and maintain both. So then from your, from your perspective, what has it been like being able to build yourself through how many years of jujitsu now? It's going to be five this year. So five years of jujitsu while still lifting for strength that entire time, still squatting, still deadlifting. You've hit your heaviest deadlift numbers while doing jujitsu, mm -hmm. correct? What's, what's your best deadlift again? Six uh, something? 650. 650 yeah. while doing jujitsu and being a pro 
purple belt under a highly respected instructor by the name of Austin Baker, a very, a very high level black belt here in Arizona and across the United States. Being able to say that you're a purple belt under an instructor like that while still maintaining your lifting load is something that to me is more rare than it should be because the, the stigma is automatically gonna be, you know, lifting heavy is going to ruin your joints or you can't sustain that, it's gonna ruin your flexibility, it's gonna be hard to juggle both, all these different things versus like the typical jujitsu workout where you're doing a Turkish get up or you're doing a arm drag against a resistance band or, or something silly like that. Why do you think that the style of lifting that you've been doing ties into the jujitsu that you've been able to actually progress in mm -hmm. the last five years? Yeah. So, um, with your, like with your program, like just with your coaching in general, with your guidance, like I'll start there. Um, there is a lot of emphasis on, um, like very, uh, I don't want to call it extended deep and I guess extended ranges of mm -hmm. motion under, um, under load, I think, if I could say that generally. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like, so for example, um, if we're doing like, if it's, if it's squat, I mean, we'll, we'll, you'll have a squat pretty low, mm -hmm. but obviously there's a load on top of that. And then there's a pause mm -hmm. and then, and then we have to get back up obviously. Or if we're doing some sort of, um, like dumbbell bench or chest press, obviously it's, it calls for full range of motion, if not past that yeah. or dips. Um, and then like slowly, but surely then there's a load added to it. So it's like, we're being taught to be put in these, um, like precarious positions in different parts of our joint joints that would like we would find ourselves in jujitsu. Cause I mean, obviously you know better than most, like you get put into the strangest positions in jujitsu. Like you're not always going to be like at a, at a perfect 90 degree. If you're trying to like frame someone off of you or something like that, sometimes you're going to be past that. So why not train, past that and I like I like that philosophy that you've kind of imbued into myself and the rest of your clients is like um, is, is practice being in those positions and practice having some loads on it that way you're essentially like protecting yourself mm -hmm. and you're making yourself stronger in literally places that no one no one else is strong in right right um, that being said um, I just feel like in jujitsu I've been able to my strength is just been able to outmatch mm -hmm. a lot of just like people I roll with because I'm mobile, but I'm also strong in precarious positions because I, we train that all the yeah. time and, and no hate to like any jujitsu specific, like the conventional, like Turkish getups or anything. But I, I like, how often are you going to find yourself in like that specific Right. Movement. I mean like, yeah. yeah. So to expand upon that, I think one of the things that the people that drink the Kool-Aid of jujitsu specific exercises are, well, when are, when are you ever squatting in jujitsu? When are you ever benching in jujitsu? Overhead press, rowing, all these different things. It's like qu quite literally speaking, no, I'm not like standing up mm -hmm. and then squatting down and then getting up again, or I'm not doing this to get somebody off of me. Maybe, hope, I don't know, maybe <laughs> you do that, right? I don't know. I'm telling you to do that. Anyways. Um, <laughs> But the thing is though, if you look at a squat, if you look at a bench, if you look at a, any type of pull, row, pull down, overhead press, these are all movements that are being done in one way or another in jujitsu, whether I'm in type of a single leg squat position while this one's posted out, or I'm framing here with my partner and I'm, and I'm re replicating these positions in jujitsu that with a dip, with a bench press, with a row, with a pull up are all replicated. But that's why we do full range of motion in the gym because whether it's me needing strength here or here or here, we work through all of that. Versus if I were to say, well, let's just stop everything and do BOSU ball squats or weighted arm drags or Turkish get-ups or whatever it's like you may develop strength in that one particular movement pattern maybe but as we know jujitsu is so technique based that it's just so much smarter to cover strength from the totality of, of exercises that are gonna cover a lot dips push pushes rows squats as I said deadlifts in a safe way so that when we have to express the strength that we built in the gym on the mat, 
we can express it in any given scenario because we know we've done our these and we've done our these and we've done our these and and those are the jujitsu specific exercises that to me cover the, the most broad basis if you get too specific you may get something out of it but then you're, you're missing the, the entire pie of what we're trying to eat here that's that's my personal opinion so there's there's certain movements that I see that you know I can see how that makes sense however it's just if a jiu-jitsu athlete comes in let's say you for example will use this to transition a jiu-jitsu athlete that prioritizes time in the gym that prioritizes time in jujitsu that prior prioritizes time in their relationship with their with their family with their friends with their girlfriend and prioritizes i don't know like law school how am i going to get to the gym three to four times a week and pick exercises that are going to get the most done in the shortest amount of time possible so that every single second i spend in the gym means something for every single second that i spend on the jujitsu mat and so on versus again if you have an hour to lift or 75 minutes and you're doing weighted arm drags on each side or turkish get-ups and that's what you spend your time doing well you're just missing out on so much more than other things that other things are able to cover. Mm -hmm. So that, that's huge. Now, using that to transition, as you heard, we got the weightlifting side of things, we got the jujitsu side of things. He got his purple belt, again, like I said, under a highly respected instructor, somebody that's competed at the highest level, EBI, IBJJF, ADCC trials, you name it. I've competed against him multiple times and lost every single time. With that said, you got your purple belt underneath this man competing and also going through an entire law school process. And then I know you're gonna have to tell, tell everybody, but f studying for the bar that comes after that and all, and all these various tests that are within law school. How the hell did you juggle lifting your relationship, your friends, getting to that point of jujitsu, which is gonna require, I don't know, three, four, at least times training a week, and then being able to pass through law school from ASU, one of the better law schools, correct? Yeah. With flying colors, how, how do you do that? Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you. Um, yeah, it's very yeah nice. no worries, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the parts we're cutting out, but go ahead. Okay. Um, I think the, the biggest, there was a huge learning curve coming in. Um, cause law school or just in general? In general, yeah, well, like law school included, because law school is like, nothing like undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, there's just, it, it requires so much time and practice and patience and like, honestly, like heartbreak too, because you like, you'll go through undergrad and think and like get like a 4.0 GPA and so on and so forth. And like, think you're the smartest person ever. You've made it to like, at the time, ASU is a top 25 law school when mm -hmm. I got in. And you think you're the smartest person ever. They fell out because of you or? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> okay. <Yeah>. Oh. <laughs> but, um, so. You, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. You, you were very, um, so you, you get there and like, I, it almost feels like the first thing they want you to know is you're not as smart as you think you are mm -hmm. because just between like the testing and the midterms and like everything that you have to read. I mean, some of the things that you have to read are from like the 1800s, like just mm -hmm. really old judicial opinions, um, that don't even seem like English. Mm -hmm. And it's like read pages like one through 40 by tomorrow and that's like the first class you've ever had in law school and then that's only for one class and then you have to go there and then there's cold calling which is like they um there's like let's say there's a class of 60 people mm. and at any point at any given time oh, they yeah. can just yeah like mm. call on you um at it like just specific very specific like minute details um i had a professor that was like that would ask about specific conversations within like mm. a 30 page like uh set of of readings of case study um all that to say is like it's a huge learning curve in that you have to learn how to almost rearrange your entire life because it's like you have to learn how to manage your time to be able to get all this reading done to be able to understand it um and then to be able to like have it ready just in case you're called on um so no one's gonna help you like yeah. that that's the thing is like the professors are almost un very unwilling to help you they will let you sit there for two minutes and stew mm. while you're flipping through pages um 
So learning how to how to manage my time with the increased workload and the increased difficulty and um, just everything else that was going on in life, that was probably the biggest thing that I had to tackle. And then on top of that, jujitsu, because like that is one of the most important things in my life, and so is lifting. Um, and there was there was just a good period of time where I think I. I didn't know how to fit all of that in there until I really learned how to prioritize my time. And I think that is a good one word answer to your question is priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and to caveat off that, like time management, because I had to learn how to almost um, work from okay, well, I like law school is my career and that's, yeah. that's what's going to make me money and my, uh, my living in the future. I got to this point, I had to t take the test to get in, um, which is called the LSAT, the law school admissions test. Um, I had to take the test in, spend all the money on top of that to prepare for it. So I'm here. Like I have to, I have to get through this because this has been, I've, I wanted to be a lawyer since I was five. Mm -hmm. And like, I was like, this is, this is the dream come true. So now I have to finish it. So like that was block number one. And then of course, like I have my family and my girlfriend, mm -hmm. um, um, who I like obviously like need to give time to and like not only like for them but it's like for me too like my like my own like uh, mental health and my own like emotional well-being and yeah. so on and so forth and then like still on that same tier like I consider you Matt Irving like on that same level of like family like I like I still need to see these people um, and it was like for, for a while I was like how the hell am I gonna do this but it yeah. it, it came down to like figuring out like a, a, a schedule that would work out well for myself and my family and my friends. Um, so after some practice of just like, okay, this is how I'm gonna do it. Like I'm gonna make every second of the day count. And I think that attitude changes when everything changed for me. Mm -hmm. um, like my performance in school, like me being able to like see everybody. Cause for a while, like I was definitely like a recluse just trying to keep up with my like law school studies. Yeah. Um, but when I learned how to prioritize things and realize like, okay, yes, law school is important, but if I dedicate only all of my time to it, like I'm, I'm going to fizzle out. Mm -hmm. Um, and so once I learned how to manage my time and make every single second count, like if I was like, if I was sitting at like a doctor's appointment, I would bring my book with me or like a bar, like my barber or something like that. I would bring my book with me and like be reading and get things done. Um, so that way, like I could just be able to like do these things outside of school. Cause I think for the first few weeks or the first few months, like I wouldn't I'd go to jujitsu or lift as often or see you guys as often because, um, I would, I would probably be studying until 11 o'clock at night because I thought that's what I had to do. But when I learned how to prioritize my time and make every minute count, um, I was, I like set a, like a time for myself, 5 PM. I'm done like a work day. That's it. Like I'm done. I'm not touching a book. If I have to wake up at 4 AM tomorrow and finish it, I'm going to do that. Um, but that sense of urgency and that sense of like making every second count so that I could still do these things so I could still succeed. Like that's what, that's what changed it for me. So that way, like I was able to do all the, all the other things that I love and see the people that I love. Um, but I would say that that was probably like the biggest thing is learning how to prioritize everything and, and fit everything, um, the way I needed it to. Yeah. And I would say from the standpoint of your friend, outside of like a couple of jokes in there, you really didn't notice a lack of a mirror. You know, there's, there's, there's people out there that have less reason to not be around, but you seem to do a very good job of prioritizing the things that mean the most to you. So like from the standpoint of me or Matt, you know, we knew you're doing law school. We know you're doing jujitsu yeah. and I never felt like, Oh, like where's the mirror? He's like ghosted us or whatever. But I think also the cool part of that is <clears throat> within your priorities, jujitsu and lifting, you have friends that like to do that as well. Yeah. So like you almost knock out two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. And that that's like great to be able to do jujitsu with your friends or lift it with your friends or stuff like that. So that on a harder week where you don't have time to hang out or you don't have time to, to hang out with your girlfriend or whatever the case may be, yeah. you at least touch on these things with the things that you also are prioritizing throughout the week. I think that's huge is, you know, what kind of, what circle are you putting yourself in? Is, 
is yeah. your is your circle within the the things or the groups that you're in like are you in the same rooms as the people mm -hmm. that you're that you're really wanting to be around like in your jujitsu or with your lifting friends or or even with your law school friends and that way you touch on the social aspect of things but more often than not you're able to maintain a level of discipline while also touching on that social side that yeah. most humans need at least a pinch of you know mm -hmm. so that's interesting now we go into you maintain a lifting schedule you maintain a jujitsu schedule that allows you to become a purple belt you maintain a schedule that allows you to graduate law school flying colors but the thing that separates you from anybody else that i know period out of any story that i've ever heard is you've done all those things you have two little brothers a huge family but unexpectedly your mom passes and now you are literally in charge of everything while you're doing jujitsu, while you're lifting and while you're going to law school. How the hell do you put yourself in that situation, obviously without any preparation, to get through the emotions, to build the strength it takes to get through all that and still prioritize the shit that means the most to you? How do you do that? And now coming out of it, what's your perspective on how strong that you've gotten having to deal with all of that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like you said, right before I like actually my first day of law school, a few months before my mom passed away. Yeah. And so I was, um, I was named the personal representative or executor of her estate, which, um, is essentially like if there is no will, if there is no like trust or something like that, I'm the one that kind of consolidates everything and then like take take care of all, all the assets and, you, and so on. You and were 20 or how long? How old? I was, I had just turned 23. Okay. okay yeah. Gotcha. So I was like, I was 22. Yeah. When she passed away and I was starting to handle all that stuff, um, at the age of 22 and I had just turned 23. Yeah. Um, it, so I think the biggest thing to me was like, okay, well I'm the one that has to like handle this. Cause I, I, Again, it's like I was the I was the oldest, and so uh, I had to be able to. I don't want to say like put my grief away because that that's not the right like way of saying it, and that's not something that I would recommend to anybody. But there is an element of like you you just have to do what you got to do like to get these things done because like no one else is going to do it mm -hmm. and that's not to say that like none of my family wouldn't have stepped in or anything like that but like it's that i like i felt i owed a duty to my mom yeah. and my brothers and my dad and like um and the rest of my family because it's like yeah, again it's like <clears throat> who like who else is going to do this for right like who's like there's just so much that goes into that and so many like so many different like encumbrances that you come up on because like obviously like you're you're trying to sell somebody's house like yeah. else's house their car for them and like like banks aren't going to like take too kindly to like mm -hmm. someone you know you, yeah. you there's so many hoops you have to jump through but like <clears throat> it's it's that element of like I, I i owed a duty to like myself my mom her memory my brothers the rest of my family her family like to to get these things squared away in the most perfect way possible and like at the same time like i wanted to make sure that my brothers were as insulated as possible from it from like just everything like in and like i it, if i could take all of their pain yeah. and put it onto myself just so they didn't have to like experience that so that they could grieve so that they could go forward yeah. like i i would die a happy man like that 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 was my goal and so like throughout that like that was kind of my thing is like, this is for my brothers. This is for like myself. This is for my mom. So it's like, even though it got really tough, like we, like there was a point where with law school, with jujitsu, with lifting, like we were like down to the wire, like thankfully, like, and I'm, I'm great friends with the probate attorney now. Like he's a, he's a fantastic guy, but, um, and he was even like, you know, if, if it's like another week or two, cause we had like a year retainer with him. He's like, if it's a, if it's another week or two, even like, uh, like a month, whatever, like I'll, I'll make sure like, you know, you're not going to get an invoice from me. Like at this point, like we were waiting on like taxes to be filed. Cause you still have to file taxes on behalf of the person that passed away. Mm -hmm. Um, he was like, if you're waiting like another week, it's not going to be a problem. Like you're totally fine. Okay. But like, I, I still felt stressed out. Like it was down to the wire. Like I think 
literally in the 11th hour, I think like by end of business day, the day the retainer was supposed to end, finally the accountant got back to me and was like, taxes are done, you're totally like done with this whole thing. But like, it, it was extremely stressful because it was like, I didn't know how to do any of these things. I was 22, like I'd lived in my mom's house at that point. Like I. I'd never sold a house before. I'd never sold a car before. Like, I didn't know what a lien was on a house. I didn't know, what, I barely knew what a mortgage was. So it was like, not only those like very like administrative things, but it was also just like, like the, I mean, grief, like, it, grief, like grief and divorce, like death and divorce bring out like some of the craziest emotions in people, right? Like, and, and like death and divorce will show you like who's who in your life for sure. And, um, all that being said, like there, there is like an emotional and social element to it too, where you're trying to like wade through that. And there's so many people in your ear as to like, Oh, well, mom would have wanted this mom would have wanted that. And like, <clears throat> just like learning not only the administrative side of things, but like just people, like life in general, like it, it really was baptism by fire. Like where I like, I, I, I had to learn a lot about life in a short period of time. Um, but all that to say, like what got me through it was just like being able to close it up for my brothers and my mom. And like, that was it. Like that was my, like, that was my duty. That was my mission. And I think like, that's what kept me going forward even though sometimes like i definitely want to like give up like i definitely want to quit like there was a point where i considered like as i was going into law school and all this was happening i was like well maybe i should just like defer my admission and go next year or maybe i should just like i i was full on ready to like quit it in january because that's when like that was the height of everything but like my mom passed away knowing that like i was going to go to law school and be a lawyer so i was like well like again, I have to do it for her. Like, um, and obviously like a lot of it is for myself. A lot of it, you know, is for like my dad and, and so on and so forth. But like, it was just like my, like my duty to, to do that. Like there, it was my job. Like there was no ifs, ands or buts like that had to get done. Um, and so I, I think the other part of that is just like what got me through it was also, you touched on it before a little bit, like understanding friends and family, right? Like you, like you guys knew I was going through a lot of stuff. You guys were you're the most understanding people about it. And like, you like just having a supportive village that like you, like you also learn who you can lean on. And like, that's what friends are for. Like, it's not a selfish thing. Like I, I would do the absolute same, like for you, God forbid, if it came to that long time from now or Matt or whoever, like in our friend group, like again, it's like my duty, like as you're like one of your best friends, like to do that. So having understanding friends that like, and girlfriend, like my, like my girlfriend, Blake is, we've been dating since like high school. This will actually tomorrow's our anniversary. I, I don't even want to. Nice. You want to say anything to Blake? Thank you for tidying up the house. Damn. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. I appreciate you, but like stuff like that, right? Like <laughs> I'm, I'm segueing into <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, that's how you know they've been but, dating for a long time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like that. That was like the other thing is, is like she like being able to like help at least um, like do things that I wasn't able to do at the time, like simple things like clean the house. Like, and I'm a very, like, I'd like to consider myself as a very tidy person, but like when like you're kind of letting things go at that oh, point, yeah. she was like the person that was like there to like pick up the pieces, both, both figuratively and literally like, just the amount of like support that she gave me, the amount of like motivation to like continue going forward. Like I, I, I just, I can't imagine like, like what, mm -hmm. you know, what I would have done, you know, without yeah. her. And like, there, like I said, grief is a weird thing, dude. Like you, you go through so many different stages and there's like a proven like seven, you know, stages of grief or whatever. And those aren't necessarily like, Oh, like, yeah, over seven days, you're going to go through this or over seven months. Like it can be years. Like you can go through one stage one year and another like stage for two years. Like, but she was there for all of them and she supported me through all of them. And like, it's just like, it's not easy. Like for someone and like on, on top of that, the stress of law school, like and everything else, like for her to like be so patient and so understanding and so loving and like to continue to like motivate me and, and like continue to like 
push and like listen to all my crazy like anxiety driven rants like she was there the whole time so she was like my safety net my she's still yeah all of that to me that's beautiful but yeah that's and and to your question about like how i feel strength wise going forward like i feel there there is a more this is kind of aside from the strength but like there is an appreciation I think I have for life and the people in my life and time in general. And um, you, you just like, I mean, you look at things so much differently. Like you, you, you don't take anything for granted. Cause like literally in, in a second, like in a night, like your life can change. You, you can get knocked into a different life like that. And like the world just keeps on spinning. Like, you know, and, and so I think just realizing that that stuff can happen but you can still survive like and there are people there that can get you through it and that you've gotten yourself through it i think i have a renewed faith in myself since all of that that like i i can get through the literal worst like it's gonna suck but like i can do all of that oops um <laughs> I can, I can, what if that sent like a text message to somebody? <laughs> um, I can do like all of that and like, and go to school and like do this and that. So like, it's just like having the faith in my, and confidence in myself to know that like, I can get through the worst and I can get other people through the worst and I can like be a leader of my family. And like, um, I think, I think that was the, like, those are the biggest things for me. Like right now I'm like, I just like, I, at first, and this is like a weird, I guess, like tangent, but like, I think for a while I thought like hope and love were like these super like dangerous things. Cause like, you know, like you love someone like your mom or, and this is like a realization I've made within the last like year and a half. And again, it's like, it's never too late for you to like go through these stages. But like, I, I thought it was almost poisonous because it's like, if you lose, like you love someone, you invest your like heart into someone, whether it's family, friends, but it's like, they could get taken, they could leave, they could break up with you, they could die. Like, and so being able to like go from that to then like almost renewing like your belief in that, like my belief in that, I, I that's definitely something I had to go through within the last year and a half. Cause it was like, I noticed that I was distancing, distancing myself like emotionally from people, like people closest to me and like not allowing myself to like, like love someone fully. But I, I learned that it takes more strength to be able to do that. And that takes courage and like, yeah, it'll, it'll hurt like hell if something like that happens, but to be able to like dust yourself off and get back to it and like realize like, okay, like it's much better to like love someone fully and appreciate it while you're here. Cause again, you don't know how long we'll be here or something like it's that, that takes courage and strength. And like, yeah. that's something that I, I'm like still repracticing like every day that I can, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's very long winded answer to your question. Yeah. And it was a great answer. Yeah. Blake's great. The amazing supporter of myself and how strong for as long as I've known you and just to see how she is with you. It makes me feel very fortunate to have that now finally with Claire. So, but you've, you've had that since, you know, 10 or 10 years ago now. So yeah. like her being in your life is like, that's no coincidence. So congratulations to you both on that. That's amazing. In regards to the story, the thing that I think about when you say all that is just, you did all that, but you did all that like almost so seamlessly. What what I say? You did all that so seamlessly from the perspective of myself and I, I'm sure Matt would agree. It's like, we know you're going through that, but we don't have any reference of experience to be like, oh yeah, I know how he feels. We know we should be there for you, but we can only be there for you so much or as much as you allow us because we can't truly say I relate to what you're feeling. I, it's, it's nearly unimaginable what you went through. And then it's interesting to hear the things that you had to do down to the nitty gritty of lawyers and house and car and all these different things. And I can only imagine there's 10 times more things that you haven't even said that you were also dealing with on the other end be, between outside of jujitsu and uh, lifting and being a lawyer and then that. So it's incredible. And it's, and it, I think about it, it's like, you could, you could have 50% or less or more of that story that you just said, 
And if you wanted to leverage that on social media, you would have over a million followers. It's fucking crazy to think about. But you don't, and that's fine, because not everyone's gonna do that, but you don't. And you didn't run to social media, and you, you just took care of your shit. You took care of your shit, and you didn't tell anybody that wasn't relative, and you just like did all of that for nothing more than the, the honor of your mom, taking care of your brothers, making sure that you showed up for your family, and just doing what you needed to get done. And that is like so rare nowadays to do all that, but then not expect any praise, which is why, you know, I understand it's a rough topic, but to be able to be one of the first things that publicly like praises that, like that's, that's fucking incredible. Like there's, there's nobody that I've ever met to deal with all those things in conjunction and come out as strong as you have to be so stoic in your explanation above all else, you know, that's just... You know, if you cried right now, I wouldn't blame you, you know, and I'm sure you have, but to be able to have the composure and the overall understanding and maybe even like closure to the situation to where you can speak in an educational way, that's a level I can't even fathom and nor could I even replicate that myself. So it's just, it's fucking phenomenal. So now transitioning to somewhat of a lighter topic, the last two things I want to do. Your top three green flags of a jiu-jitsu gym, go. Well, green, your coach wants to roll with you. Um, like makes a, and not, not just you, but like everybody, like is investing in everybody, wants to like see how everybody's progress is, wants to roll with them. I think that's number one. And like in that same vein, a coach that like, I mean, barring injuries or whatever, but like, um, or age, whatever it might be, like a coach that does compete and like, it doesn't even have to be like, be like super high level, just as long as they're competing, you know, and kind of putting their money where their mouth yeah. is and so on and so forth. Again, barring any injuries and, and so on and so forth, but I, I think that would be number one. Yeah, not a requirement, but definitely a plus for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, John Danaher, I mean, he doesn't compete. Right, so, you it's know. the mastermind. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so number two, I would say a, a oh, well, clean gym is one of them. Um, a very clean gym. I, I think if you're running into issues where like people are getting uh, infections all the time um, and just like it's it's just a it's just a gross environment. I think that tells you um, not only about the overall hygiene of the gym, but I think that tells you. Uh, the value or the lack thereof that the instructor, the head instructor, the owner has on uh, on hygiene and keeping their gym clean, mm -hmm. um, a, a clean and safe training environment for mm -hmm. everybody says a lot. Um, I think number three, um, straying away from a set curriculum. Um, I understand that there are lesson plans and there are themes as to what you want to, um, as to what you want to teach over the next few weeks. But, and like, I, I think you touched on it in a very separate topic with the lifting, but extreme specificity, um, mm -hmm. I think is more of a detriment than anything else. Um, and so a coach that like focuses on, on concepts and really like um, drives home the idea of fundamentals and, and concepts, I think that's what you wanna look for. Yeah, I think overall like over specificity on, on specific moves mm -hmm. is, is pretty dangerous um, versus you, you having a coach that focuses on, on concepts is that's gonna, ha that's gonna take you a long way. Um, yeah, covers, covers a lot more with much less time. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so I would say those are my my three. Yeah, that's great. So then now, really, then this is something I did in the first one. I plan to keep doing it. The way we wrap up the episode is, and this is kind of going off of how Claire does hers, but one thing you're proud of, and then two things that you're chasing. One thing I'm proud of, and two things. Um, I would say... One thing I'm proud of is like that I've made it to this point. I know that covers a lot, but um, like we talked about before, I recently just passed the bar exam, mm -hmm. um, which is extremely difficult. It's a two, two day exam, but like everything that we talked about leading up to this point, um, I think that's what I'm, is like yep. my career, I think is, is what I would say. and. Um, two things that I'm chasing. Um, I don't know, that's, that's difficult. That's a, um, 
it's a really open-ended question because I think that's kind of the point, brother. No, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for the f and not to say that I'm not chasing. Like I have goals in jiu-jitsu. Like yeah. um, it, it could be anything. It, it doesn't even have to be a, a serious answer necessarily. Just like yeah. when you hear the word "I'm chasing," what what comes to mind? I'm. I think I'm chasing the next like thing. I for the first time in my life, I don't have a. Mm. You know, a fight to fight, mm -hmm. or to to say it like that. Um, and I think I'm also chasing like mending the fences with all of my in in that like being able to like concentrate on them, yeah. like give them just the like discretionary like all the that time that I haven't been able to have, just chasing that like chasing yeah. this like peace of mind that I have now. Um, it's not to say I don't want to push myself further, like whether it's jujitsu or whatever other like career goals that I have, but mm -hmm. I think um, I think those are the few things that I'm chasing. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really good answer. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up. Is there anything that you would like to plug? Instagram sponsors. I. Jiu Jitsu school. Yeah, I have no, uh, I train at Seoul uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu on uh, 7th Street and Glendale Avenue in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, taught by Austin Baker. And well, Fred. And Fred. And Fred. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, why'd you say it like that? Oh, I'm not supposed to? God. No way. Um, Damn, sorry, Fred. Go uh, ahead. <laughs> other than that, um, I don't really have anything else to put. Oh, you, just got really, you just got really sad when you said Fred. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. Uh, sorry, Fred. <laughs> and Fred. <laughs> um, and uh, we're gonna see Fred in about five minutes. Yeah. That's why. And uh, Jimmy House's coaching app that just came out what, like, two weeks ago. <laughs> Have you already plugged that? I think I paid you for this podcast. He didn't. He didn't. I'm not getting a dime for this. Matt's using my charger and wasting all my AC. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, the Jimmy House coaching on his app that just came out recently. I love it. Thanks. Appreciate Much better it. than Google Docs. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for having me on. Great, awesome, thank you, that was really good. I think a lot of you guys can gain a lot of perspective and inspiration and, and just learn a lot from what Amir has had to go through, but like literally just now coming out of the other side as far as, it, you haven't finished jujitsu and you're still lifting, but you literally just passed the bar and you're exiting that chapter of your life and that chapter is about like this thick, you know? And so, yeah, that's, that's a great answer. You're chasing the next thing because you've been doing the same thing now for God knows how long. Mm -hmm. And it's actually really exciting to think about, yeah, what is the next thing for you going to be? You don't have to focus on law school anymore. Yeah. Obviously, you're gonna be going into a new part of your career. And like, what, what does that mean? I'm, I'm interested to find out. I hope it means he's moving to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching i appreciate your support if you guys like the video make sure to subscribe and until next time jimmy house amir deuced <laughs> <laughs>